Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Christina Fox, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the CEO of Tech Alliance. Acknowledging the land upon which our organization sits is an important step in honoring the land and the history of the region's indigenous peoples. We begin by acknowledging the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island. As settlers, we acknowledge that this is sacred ground upon which we are privileged to live and work. We're committed to recognizing and strengthening the deep connection and the long-standing relationship between Indigenous peoples and the land of Southwest Ontario and of London. This land is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, the Etiwanderon, and the Wendat. We would also like to recognize the three First Nations communities neighboring the city of London, including the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie, Delaware Nation. We invite you to join us for a moment of reflection to think about how we continue to strengthen the connection to our land and our commitments to truth and reconciliation. As the Regional Innovation Center for Southwestern Ontario, Tech Alliance empowers world-class ventures and fuels growth in Canada's innovation economy. We champion and coach entrepreneurs, amplify and impact businesses, and contribute to a bold technology community across Southwestern Ontario. If you'd like to engage with our venture growth team, read stories about innovation propelling community prosperity and world-changing ventures or other upcoming experiences, I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter using the link in the chat. We are the place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas. And in pursuit of creating spaces where innovation thrives, we must act, be bold, and lift others as we rise. And we strive to do that in all that we do. So before we get started, here are a few housekeeping points. All participant mics are muted, so relax and enjoy. Today's masterclass will be recorded and available for replay on our YouTube channel. And I encourage you to add questions for our speaker in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So now let's use the chat. What is your top motivator for spending time with Eric today? Drop your comment in the chat. Through this masterclass, Defining Your Purpose with Corporate Social Responsibility, we'll explore the concept of business as usual has changed. Leaders seek knowledge, tools, and communities to help them create value, foster change for better companies, and a more prosperous society. Competitive advantage in the market can be attributed to how we continue to innovate and while considering our collective commitment to tech for good. Considering, planning for, and strategizing around corporate social responsibility is not only the right thing to do, but also linked to a thriving venture and elevated bottom line. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Eric Sarvell, the founder and principal of Impact uh, Consulting. He's 20 years plus of consulting and management experience in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, focuses on social impact through sustainability, corporate social responsibility, strategic philanthropy, and social purpose. Eric is also an associate with Yellow Yellow ESG Advisory, Canadian Business for Social Responsibility, the United Way BC's Social Purpose Institute, and he recently graduated from the Council of Canadian Innovators Innovation Governance Program. Organizations have relied on Eric for successful strategies, sales programs and operations, environmental social governance initiatives, partnerships, stakeholder engagement, business sustainability, and digital transformations to power their social impact goals. Eric has also supported organizations navigating and advancing the United Nations SDGs in their workplace and through their purpose. Eric is a good friend of mine. I've known him for years and I'm inspired by the change he initiates in companies through his consultancy and also as a thought leader at the intersection of innovation and philanthropy. Eric has an absolutely fantastic information rich presentation that will spark everyone to rethink about what business can look like when, the change, when we change the lens through which we, we view it. So with that, Eric, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. And thank you so much for, for having me here today. Today I'm presenting to you from Today I'm presenting to you from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth 
Celil Wadtooth Nations, also known as Vancouver. My, no, my, my home is in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm here at the Globe Forum Sustainability Conference to learn more about some of the things that we'll be speaking about today. And the world is changing at a rapid pace. We, we know this. And uh, just before I, I jump in here, everything that I'm going to be presenting to you today, this is all resources, public information, nothing here is pr proprietary. I want to give you as many resources as possible to help you with, with your journey. We'll be dropping some links into the chat uh, as we're going through and uh, referencing a lot of my sources at the bottom of the slide. So as society faces challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic, social justice, privilege, rising inequality and in costs, climate change, biodiversity loss, supply chain delays, cyber attacks, and most recently, a war, we have a lot of information coming at us from various sources and the various risks that businesses must anticipate have been highlighted and are heightened. But it's also created an, an opportunity for innovation in business operations. Boards are being looked to for help to guide organizations through these turbulent times. And it, it's great to see the registration list here we, we have from startups all the way up to publicly traded enterprise companies, which is wonderful. Now, the company Edelman has studied trust for more than 20 years and believe that it is the ultimate currency in the relationship that all institutions, business, governments, NGOs, and, and media build with their stakeholders. It is known as the Edelman Trust Barometer and annually measures trust and credibility. And in the 2022 Canadian Edelman Trust Barometer, the results show that when survey respondents were asked about how much you trust the institution to do what is right, my employer was the only trusted institution. As business owners, this puts a big responsibility on how you run your business, how you communicate, and how you create value. 71% of people reported that they worry that false information or fake news is being used as, as a weapon. So what does this mean for your business? People are activating around their values and beliefs, and this is how they are engaging with your company. You want to win the war on talent and attract best and brightest for your company. What are you doing around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access? Employees are now choosing the places they want to work based on their values and beliefs. There are lots of different reports reflecting how this is even more important to younger demographics who are making up greater percentages of the workforce. And people are also using this lens with their investments. There's a feeling that businesses are, are not doing enough to address societal issues as well. And whether addressing climate change or workforce reskilling, economic inequality or system injustice, to name a few, 78% of respondents felt that CEOs should be personally visible when discussing public policy with external stakeholders or work that their company is doing to benefit society. Amongst employees, 54% that when considering a job, they expected the CEO to speak publicly about controversial social and political issues that people cared about. Now, in the 2020 World Economic uh, Forum, they published uh, the top 10 greatest likelihood and greatest impact global risks based on five categories of strategic risk, economic, environment, geopolitical, societal, and technological. And for the first time ever, the top five most likely global risks are all environmental. In Deloitte's 2020-2021 Corporate Guide, Corporate Governance Ask the Right Questions, it states that it can be challenging for boards to connect these global issues, such as climate change and water scarcity and human rights, to the organization's operations, strategy, and risk profile. Boards need to connect sustainability with corporate purpose and strategy, but do boards have the access to the sustainability information required? The gap that exists in an opportunity to define the broader universe of risks and the critical stakeholders and to determine what's required needs measurement and, and disclosure. Using climate change as an example, uh, an audit committee can consider how climate risks impact financial reporting. Uh, 
A compensation committee can align management compensation and incentives around programs on climate change initiatives. And the governance committee can consider climate change risks and an approach to climate change risk disclosure. A useful tool for the board will be their assessment of organizing, organizing, organizations' environment, social, and governance, commonly referred to as ESG's impacts. So we've already mentioned purpose, sustainability, environmental, social, and governance, ESG. It, it really is an alphabet soup. But how do organizations leverage these management practices to build back better and create business sustainability? And as you start your own companies, join other startups, or at various investment seed rounds, or working in a mature business, how do you intend to, to operate? Do you want to have a social impact? What is your reason for being? How are you going to attract top talent? How will you ensure that that top talent doesn't walk across the street to the next hottest startup? How will you mitigate risk in your organization? But how do you even know where that risk is? Let's start off by level setting on some of the various terminologies that you may hear used. And they are CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, Purpose, Sustainability, and ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. And depending where you are as a company, each, emission, each initiative may be appealing to you as a framework. Now, Corporate Social Responsibility was the initial activity that companies engaged in to do good and to think about their impact on society. It covers social and environmental risks and impacts in their business, as well as how they how it intersects with their stakeholders. It's, it's a step towards accountability. However, CSR is relatively self-regulated and the activities can vary depending on the business, the sector, and there's a challenge around standard metrics. Some believe it's not an integrated program to their purpose, but more of an add-on. Uh, there was an Alva article indicating that for some businesses, at worst, it has become a marketing tool, allowing an organization to say what it's doing well without actually having to back up its claims or talk about areas where it may be failing. And to the immense frustration of CSR professionals, it, it's failed to live up to some of its promise, largely because it has far more breadth than depth in its scope. While social, the social responsibility of business is to increase profits, an essay from Milton Friedman in 1970, it spoke to the role of business and, and how business has operated over the 50 years since. But the reality is now business, it's, it's changing. So the purpose of an organization and focus has now shifted to all stakeholders and not just shareholders and has gained tremendous momentum culminating in a couple of years ago in an announcement by the Business Roundtable. Now, the, the Business Roundtable is an association of chief executive officers of America's leading companies working to prom promote a thriving U.S. economy and expanded opportunity for all Americans through sound public policy. The announcement was the, the release of a new statement on the purpose of a corporation signed by 181 CEOs to commit to lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. Purpose-driven companies are starting, starting to outperform their peers, and a Deloitte Monitor report speaks to an integrated purpose strategy focused on the differentiated role that a company serves in society is good business strategy that drives sustainable long-term value. In fact, purpose strategy is increasingly the business imperative to manage enterprise risk, build trust with customers, investors, and other stakeholders, and develop new markets. The idea of purpose is reinforced by Larry Fink, CEO of uh, BlackRock. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager with over $8 trillion in assets. And through his annual letter to CEOs and speaking about a company's purpose. And if you're familiar with Mr. Fink's letters, you, you'll recognize the second bullet here, 
where in his 2021 letter, he, he stated that the more your company can show its purpose in delivering value to its customers, its employees, and its communities, the better able you will be to compete and deliver long-term durable profits for shareholders. His 2022 letter stated, putting your company's purpose at the foundation of your relationships with your stakeholders is critical to long-term success. Employees need to understand and connect with your purpose. And when they do, they can be your staunchest advocates. Customers want to see and hear what you stand for as they increasingly look to do business with companies that share their values. And shareholders need to understand the guiding principle driving your vision and mission. They will more likely to be to support you in those difficult moments if they have a clear understanding of your strategy and, and what's behind it. Organizations are, are now turning to social purpose experts to help them deliver a social purpose, build the business case for social purpose and embed it into their entire business. An article in the Harvard Law, Forum, Law, Harvard Law School Forum on corporate governance states that it's wrong to use purpose and sustainability interchangeably. The article proposes that purpose and sustainability are related but different ideas. Purpose comes first. Sustainability can either contribute to it or can detract from it. It also states that the purpose of a company is to produce profitable solutions to problems of people and planet while at the same time not profiting from producing problems for people or planet, a failure in sustainability. Companies that are making investments in sustainability while failing to produce profitable solutions to people and planet are also failing in purpose. Companies that are profitable while degrading the environment and society, they're focused on profits, not purpose. Now, the Oxford Learner's Dictionary reflects the meaning of sustainability as the use of natural products and energy in a way that does not harm the environment and the ability to continue or be continued for a long time. The older school of thought of sustainability, it infers environmental activities, and that's changed now. It's not just a green activity, but it's, it's come to be embedded in all business practices and operations. It can lack a little clear meaning, uh, but generalized as doing better, depending on how an organization communicates its sustainability ambition. On the flip side, companies have robust sustainability programs that advance the entire business. And increasing trend in sustainability is companies that are declaring their net zero climate ambition goals by 2050 or earlier uh, in accordance with the Paris, Paris Accord. And simply put, net zero means cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible with any remaining emissions reabsorbed from the atmosphere by oceans and forests, for instance. Sustainability is frequently interchanged with CSR or a, a term triple bottom line. A triple bottom line is historically been measured in three areas, people, planet, and profit. Now, the biggest difference between sustainability and ESG, environmental, social, and governance, a, a really hot buzzword that uh, many of you have, have probably been hearing about over the last few years. Uh, its measurement. ESG policy, policies have specific metrics to measure, and they can be benchmarked against other companies through scoring and ratings. And they are core to business strategy and embedded in the operations. ESG factors include all the business practices related to these three areas and now touches on everything in between. And as expected, the, the E is focused on environmental issues. So your climate, your biodiversity loss, uh, carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions, uh, air, water use, water pollution, uh, et cetera. The S focuses on stakeholder engagement, uh, such as giving back to your communities that the business operates in, customer satisfaction, health and safety, human rights, employees, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and access. And finally, G focuses on issues like your board of directors and leadership composition, audit, compliance, et cetera. 
all the information that was either limited or did not exist in reviewing financial statements when investors were looking to determine the health and operations of a company are now captured in ESG programs. Investors are looking more closely at ESG ratings for publicly traded companies and rating agencies are reviewing this ESG data when making investments. ESG investing factors in many more data points versus sustainable investment, which has traditionally been more focused investments on social and environmental criteria. And one indication on this major shift in that alpha article I mentioned earlier uh, was them talking about in March 2019, the Global Reporting Initiative, which is a, a framework for companies to be able to report on sustainability. Uh, there, they noted that in the two decades ago, there was only a handful of companies that were disclosing environmental performance, while now 93% of the world's largest companies by revenue report information on their ESG through this global reporting initiative, GRI frameworks. So whether you're a new startup, mid-growth or mature, these management activities can still apply to you. And if you're thinking about an initial public offering, uh, an IPO, ESG will be critical as these rating agencies and your investors will now be looking at you in your business in a whole new light. Here's just uh, an introduction uh, to the idea around purpose and business and uh, a few resources. Uh, if you're passionate about uh, reading, these are some great books that you can go to. Uh, the one, for instance, with, with Mark Benioff, the, the chair, co-CEO and co-founder of Salesforce, he is a good example of this. He, some of his initiatives was him talking about valuing purpose alongside profit and how we need a new capitalism because the current system has led to profound inequality. And uh, you likely heard a couple of years ago how Salesforce spent approximately 10.3 million to ensure equal pay for equal work at the organization. The KPMG 2020 CEO Outlook uh, COVID-19 Special Edition offers a unique lens on evolving attitudes as the pandemic has unfolded. And KPMG initially surveyed 1,300 CEOs in January and February of 2020 before many key markets were beginning to feel the full impact of the lockdowns. Then in July and early August of that year, they conducted a follow-up survey of 315 CEOs to understand how that thinking has evolved. And 79% also had to reevaluate their purpose as a result of COVID-19 to better address the needs of their stakeholders. And as the report stated, with profound consequences for people's health and livelihoods, as well as the future of companies and industries, the pandemic has presented CEOs with the greatest possible test of their leadership abilities and personal resilience. As a result, CEOs are using this moment in history to lead with increased purpose and impact, both societal and economic. And they're leading with empathy and humanity as they prioritize talent and corporate responsibility and rewiring their businesses for tomorrow's new reality. As reflected in the Edelman Trust Barometer earlier, CEOs recognize how they needed to manage the climate related risks and see this activity as a direct contributor to whether they're gonna keep their jobs or not. The stat that jumps out at me on this slide is, is how 77% say that their purpose has helped them understand what they need to do to meet the needs of their stakeholders. So their employees, their communities, their customers, their partners, and their investors and say, their purpose provides a clear framework for making quick and effective COVID-19 related decisions. Purpose has become a central pillar for CEOs and 79% say they feel a stronger emotional connection as their corporate pur to their corporate purpose since the crisis began. And at the same time, however, this massive disruption uh, and impact that we've had of the pandemic has caused so many CEOs to question whether their current purpose really meets the needs of their stakeholders. Carefully listening to different stakeholders and encouraging dialogue will be an important element of this reevaluation, particularly if it becomes clear that the current purpose needs to be adjusted to better meet the needs of a stakeholder group. 
social purpose is an emerging business trend in which companies bring their unique set of corporate assets to addressing social challenges and improve social conditions through business. This benefits companies by growing their business and strengthening the work that they do, the environment in which they operate, and the relationships they have with customers, communities, and the public. It also helps create stronger communities and thriving societies. The, the profit motive is quite interesting because it has these, these two models where one is seen as transcending prof profitability and then the other as purpose being the route to profitability. The social purpose of a business sits on top of this vision. And, and I love this slide because it really is that, that great snapshot of what, as it states, what it should be versus what it's not. And it really is that top of the vision, the purpose is on top of that vision, mission, and company values. It, it really is a top-down approach to that it, and it's core to the business model. And you'll note a primary difference is a social purpose is aspirational. It's a North Star for an ongoing quest versus just a, a goal or a strategy that can be achieved. So it's it's not tactical or a giving back exercise. Your, your social purpose is your way of doing business. Now the next two slides are a really great resource for, for businesses and as you think about where you are on this continuum and where you want to go, uh, the United Way BC Social Purpose Institute is providing this continuum as a tool to help companies where they can take their CSR, corporate affairs, community relations to that next level towards embedding social purpose at their core. And it can help businesses identify where they are today and what the benefits and strategies are to moving up the continuum. And as you, as you look at this continuum, you may be identifying some of your activities at, at your organization as a, say a 1.0 philanthropic activity, but then you're identifying some of the pieces that might sit in a version 2.0 under strategic, and, and that's okay. This is a journey. And if you're not doing any of these activities, but you wanna start, don't feel like you have to start at, at version one and, and move up. You can potentially set up your program to become a social purpose program and, and move right up to that 4.0. An important piece to note is at the bottom of that social purpose column and how this really is CEO led. This, this is top down on the purpose of that corporation. And just as we take a look at uh, a continuation of the, the continuum, it's exciting to see what, what really jumps out at me is the customer role as part of that purpose. And in that version of 1.0, the, the customer has no participation in this whatsoever versus as they go through the continuum here and you get the social purpose, this becomes a customer movement on how they are engaging with your business. For those of you that have a social impact program already, it's moving from inputs to outcomes to now impact. And this is long-term viability for business. Social purpose business is, it's really taking off in, in Canada. And the first national virtual dialogue on, on social purpose business, the Propelling Purpose Summit, uh, the Road to the Purposeful Economy was hosted in November of 2021. And it helped propel this move to a future where social purpose is mainstream. And the summit convened uh, about 325 leading thinkers uh, and leaders to jumpstart Canada's purpose economy and accelerate the purpose pivot. As the summit revealed four imperatives and 12 action areas that comprise the framework for action to accelerate the transition to this purpose economy. So when we look at uh, in, in the in transition and the idea of proposing this going, going forward in a system standpoint, metrics and reporting and developing a framework to measure and report on social purpose is critical capital markets, they need to convene an ecosystem around them to advance purpose finance 
and investing. Business schools. We need to redefine business school education to include social purpose. And some of this is, is happening already. And with public policy, we need support of all levels of government to create enabling environments for social purpose businesses. Now the suggested actors that need to be a part of this, civil society, the support of nonprofits and civil society groups to collaborate with social purpose businesses is, is going to be very critical. Associations, supporting business and professional associations to educate their members on social purpose. And just the social purpose community building out this ecosystem and mapping and identifying and figuring out where those strengths and, and gaps are will be, will be important. For diversity, consideration needs to be given to inclusion. How, how are we engaging diverse communities and businesses, business organizations and social purpose business? For Indigenous knowledge, how do we embed Indigenous and non-traditional economic models in the Purpose Economy Roadmap? An awareness will come through storytelling, creating those case studies of social purpose in action, amplifying the work of social purpose heroes, accreditations to develop that or rating systems, whether you want to have it uh, bronze, silver, or gold, or, or other rating systems. And then just having that platform, developing a social purpose organizing platform to advance the framework for this action. Now, if you want to take things a, a step further as a business owner, I, I've had many conversations with startups and, and high growth Canadian companies uh, over the, the last few years. And there's been one common thread in these conversations. Business owners want to give back to the community, but many times they're not in a financial position to do so right now. So what, what can they do? And in this situation, you know, all, all funds are focused on your product uh, development, your service development, but in the future, you want to be in a position to be able to, to give back. One option is to engage with the Upside Foundation. So this is a Canadian registered charity, and uh, as stated here, the, the Upside Foundation enables founders of early stage, high growth Canadian companies to build social responsibility into their business by pledging equity to a charity or charities of their choice. So they become member companies at Upside, and then when they have that liquidity event, so either through the sale of your businesses or an initial public offering, an IPO, the cash proceeds are then distributed to the designated charity or charities. And to date, they've had uh, 15 liquidity events and raised uh, almost $3 million for 26 Canadian charities. And Canadian charities are, are really getting on board with, with these type of initiatives. And I, I'll just, uh, for example, call out uh, the Sick Kids Foundation. They are targeting high growth companies in the innovation space as part of their fundraising initiatives. And this particular uh, one, they have a program called Tech for Kids and has a goal of raising 25 million to invest in big data solutions. Now, another step that uh, organizers, organizations can take when they're thinking about um, that social impact is around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the history of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs for short, uh, began in September 2015 when 193 member states of the United Nations adopted the, the SDGs. Uh, or also referred to as the global goals. And the 17 SDGs are part of transforming our world and the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, which is an ambitious plan for people, planet and prosperity. And the SDGs are building on the momentum of the millennial development goals, uh, the MDGs, which was a set of eight goals that were the foundation for a 15 year anti-poverty movement that took place between 2000 and 2015. Now, below those 17 SDGs, there's 169 targets and 231 indicators that lay out what specifically needs to be measured and how you're measuring it to track progress. And the, the goal is to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Uh, there are three elements of sustainable development. 
economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental protection. And they are grouped under five pillars of sustainable development, also known as the five Ps, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. So what companies do is they align their businesses to the SDGs. And the SDGs should be the most aligned to your business and material enough for you to have an impact on them. You also need to be thinking about what SDGs you potentially could have a negative impact on and then look to correct that. Companies typically uh, choose, uh, you, you can, aligned to a few of them, but uh, on average, you normally see about uh, 67 SDGs that really resonate with, uh, with a company. Now, the SDGs are also seen as a lever to unlocking funding. And th this, is, this is a key slide because it, it's business and you're looking to make a, a profit in business. So if there's an opportunity to unlock funding through the SDGs, then that, that could be explored. In regards to the four economic systems here and that 12 million that, uh, that they're talking about being unlocked by 2030, there's uh, a few different economic systems uh, for these opportunities under food and culture, uh, as mentioned here, cities, energies and materials and, and health and well-being. So when considering food and agri agriculture, Reducing food waste in the value chain is an opportunity, low income food markets and reducing consumer food waste. In cities, there's opportunities to focus on affordable housing, energy efficient buildings, electric and hybrid vehicles, and public transportation in urban areas. With energy and materials, there's circular models. Um, Circularity is a model of production and consumption which involves the, the sharing, the leasing, the reusing, the repairing, the refurbishing, the recycling of existing materials and products for as long as possible. And this could be applicable to automotive, appliance, electronics, uh, and also with energy and materials, there's the expansion of renewable energy, which uh, we hear a lot about. And then in health and well-being, there you're hearing more and more around remote patient monitoring and telehealth and advanced uh, genomics, just to name a few. Now, this is a great uh, public, public resource uh, to you, and it's called the Embedding Project. So it's a, a global public health research project that helps companies embed social and environmental factors across the operations and your decision-making. And they've identified and developed the tools and companies, the tools that companies need to embed that sustainability. And they've brought it together, uh, working with global companies, harnessing their collective knowledge to generate these tools for the benefit of everyone. So the four quadrants uh, that they look at here is, is formal, advance, informal, and deliver. And just to take an example of a, a little piece of the wheel here, this, this tool allows the user to select the practice area that they are looking to then embed. And when you click into those practice areas, you'll be provided with a host of resources to assist you. So for instance, uh, taking think, think systematically, there's introductions to systems thinking, life cycle thinking, systems mapping, climate change playbooks, First Nations system thinking, and, and more. And uh, as mentioned, publicly available. Now we talked about uh, funding already and thinking, what, what does this mean for your business from a funding opportunity? Uh, so tell us, uh, uh, I believe the end of, towards the end of last year, or 2020, so my, my apologies, in November of 2020, they announced the launch of its TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good, a $100 million social impact investment fund created to power the biggest, boldest, bravest ideas in new responsible and sustainable startup businesses. And the fund will invest in entrepreneurs building solutions aimed at improving healthcare, furthering social and economic inclusion, ensuring sustainable food production and reducing our environmental footprint. So the, the TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good will fuel greater social innovation in Canada through investments in companies that generate both financial and social returns benefiting our society. 
Uh, here's a, another example of some SDG funding. So Lloyd Longfield, the Member of Parliament for Guelph at the time, on behalf of the Honourable Ahmed Hussein, Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, announced that the Guelph, a Guelph community organization, 10C Shared Space, and London, Ontario's Pillar Nonprofit Network received uh, almost $900,000 from Employment and Social Development Canada, ESDC, to, uh, as part of their Sustainable Development Goals program for a collective and collaborative project called SDG City. So it's a holistic approach to activating the SDGs in mid sized communities for long term impacts. Now, thinking about the concepts that we're looking at today, there's also an exercise here around the, myth, the risk management. So how are you mitigating your, your risk? And if you don't have full transparency throughout your entire, your entire value chain, and it doesn't matter if you're a private company or a publicly traded company, you're gonna have one or more of your stakeholders that could be shining a light on your business and there could be that negative impact. And worse in these couple examples here, you could be called out publicly as we've seen through various programs uh, such as CBC's Marketplace. So as, as mentioned earlier, if, if, you're public, if you're a publicly traded company, this may impact share price as sustainability and ESG rating agencies consider these impacts in your ratings. Expanding your enterprise risk management, that ERM to include ESG risks, can help connect risk strategy, decision making, and make organizations more competitive and resilient. So regardless of what stage your business is at, uh, there's an opportunity for you all to take some of these initiatives for greater value creation and stakeholder engagement. And I wish you all well in your journey. Eric, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. At Tech Alliance, we've actually been on a journey to co-create our purpose and priorities while bringing, life, uh, bringing that to life through our company values. So. So much of the content today makes me feel like we're on the right track. And I think of the number of companies that we work with who at their early stage, imagining a world that could be very different because they embed purpose, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, UN SDGs in their DNA of their company. Um, you know, so if we're working forward with, with uh, early stage startups and we're working backwards with large enterprise, we can actually imagine a world that is just so much more prosperous with the tools and knowledge that you've shared today. So I thank you for, for bringing so much content. I feel like we could do a whole day of this together, honestly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we've got some extra time left. So why don't we go through, um, why don't we continue this conversation with a q and I have a couple of questions that I think would certainly resonate with companies that we work with and companies who are um, beginning their work with, uh, with Tech Alliance or who are part of the Southwestern Ontario Innovation Economy and are also focused on some of the same things that you spoke about today. You know, we are hearing the term ESG more and more, and you did detail that in the, the content and talked about sort of what it is and what it isn't. If I'm an early stage startup, um, how are environmental, social, and governance frameworks most applicable to me? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting question because ESG has typically been for publicly traded companies, yes. but now you're seeing more and more it coming kind of downstream and for mid-sized companies and startups to, to think about this. And it's certainly applicable if uh, you're going to become uh, your pre-IPO and that, but just thinking about some of the concepts around it. So a lot of the ESG management and measurement, there's frameworks for it and you can take those frameworks and 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 run with it, but it, you don't need something like that as you're just starting out. So taking some of the concepts around ESG and just what it means, and you don't even need to, to use ESG terminology and it really is gonna depend on what kind of business are, are you in and uh, thinking about if it's manufacturing, if you're, if you're building a product, where where is your supply chain touching? And uh, are you doing work in other parts of the world where you need to be thinking about uh, uh, forced labor and human rights and, uh, and that? Or are you building out a service where maybe supply chain is not going to be a, as much of a focus 
for for startups governance obviously is is such a big key and something i learned even more about doing the innovation governance program and uh congratulations christina on uh, on getting into the program for the next cohort it's it's Thank great you. learning yeah and it's it's yeah it's having that underpinning of governance from a risk management standpoint from cybersecurity uh it's it's so critical for how you build your business and having those building blocks some of the some of the s parts that uh, i've spoken to organizations about in the past and yeah, it goes back to what i was saying earlier that you know we don't have enough money i would love to get back to community in that but how do you activate your people around this and especially with uh, millennials and, and gen z and gen y a lot of, of folks are climate activists now. So mm -hmm. they see what, what's happening in the future. So how can you create initiatives, whether it's volunteer initiatives internally, it doesn't matter if you're a, a company of five people or 10 mm -hmm. people, how, how do you meet those people where they are and activate with them and give them that great, that great employee experience in addition to this exciting time of building a business. So there, there has to be a little bit of, of, of give and take, and that's your way to give back in, to community now and through, through volunteerism. I really like that. Um, that coupled with the continuum slide um, really starts to hone in on if you're, if you don't have the resources necessarily to have someone to implement uh, ESG, CSR, uh, sustainability efforts and uh, social purpose and social impact, what are some of the quick or easy wins or easy first steps that someone might take regardless of the size of company? I'll, I'll share for us, for example, each of our staff members have social impact hours, meaning they can spend time with the example that you just said about environmental activism. Say we have a member of our team that is focused on environmental act activism or wants to give their time in a, to a, in a charitable capacity they have time in their day to actually do that over the course of the year. So that's that's a, a, a no cost um, alignment to social impact and social purpose with um, really honoring members of our team to have that balance of work and life and being able to do the things that they're really passionate about. So on that, that's just me giving the example of what we do here at Tech Lions. What are some other quick wins that you suggest or easy first steps regardless of size of company? Yeah, d diversity, equity, inclusion, and access is absolutely one of them. And as you're building your business, thinking about what does your workforce look like? What does your board look like? What is what is that consistency? And I know you hear about diversity and inclusion. The equity part is, is, a, is a big piece of that, but also the access. So how are you breaking down barriers for people to potentially come into your organization that you may not have considered before? So... Uh, taking and this it, it's all about the talent war right now and you want to get the, the best and the brightest and you need to have these these type of programs or you're going to be falling behind pretty quickly and yeah to me that that's just an easy first step that uh, that an organization can take especially when you're a small one and, and you're nimble and you have control over these type of initiatives yeah absolutely that's a that, that's a great example thank you um i'm also thinking about you know, we were, you were talking about the triple bottom line and you were talking about, you know, good for business and um, global prosperity. And it can be overwhelming for someone who is maybe a, a first time joiner on this masterclass and either hasn't led uh, the opportunity to have purpose in an organization or is beginning to think about how they can embed purpose. What are, um, what are some of the, thinking about people who have had sort of that pushback, what are the differentiators? You know, if someone were to say today, I really enjoyed that content, I don't know where to start, but will it actually have a difference in my business? Can you talk a little bit about why social purpose will actually differentiate the business um, from others, competitive or otherwise? It, because it permeates right through the entire business. So it is... Yeah. That is, this is your North Star. This is your reason for being. It's, it's not the mission. It's not the vision. This is why you are in business. So when you have that purpose, that purpose is internal, but it's also external as well. And when you see all of the different reports about where customers want to buy their products from, where people want to work, it's purpose-driven organizations that, that have that that value and uh, you can do a little bit more around purpose uh, you can become a, a purpose company through the united way bc social purpose institute uh, there's also uh, b corp so benefit corporation b corp 
certifications that uh, that a company can go through where you start honing in on you know how do you want to benefit society and, and get that that certification as well which is quite rigorous to to first get and then also main, maintain as well but it really is that you know that all enduring why are you in in business and that's what that driver is for how you engage all aspects in your operations and in your communities amazing well, Eric Sarvella of Impact LS Consulting, it was such a pleasure hosting you today. In this virtual capacity, I wanna thank you for drawing attention and awareness to sustainability, corporate social responsibility and purpose. You know, we know companies of all sizes have leaders seeking knowledge, tools, and communities to help them create value and help them build better companies and create a more prosperous society. And I feel like, you know, this hour spent with you is, is really incredible. It was an invaluable masterclass. Your depth of knowledge um, about corporate social responsibility and, and making it a priority is so obvious. I can, I can see the passion, your, your career, and the way that you are being a sustainer in communities is, is quite incredible. Um, I want to thank you for the inspiration today. And for those of you whose heads maybe are still spinning about um, <laughs> how to learn more and to continue to have some time with with Eric, I think the link has been dropped in the chat that you can actually book some one-to-one -one time with him during office hours tomorrow between 8.30 and 12.15. I think there's only a couple of spots left. So if this is something that you're further curious about or want to have more specific dialogue with Eric about implementation or you know, maybe there's a fork in the road on um, the work that you're doing within your company and your employee engagement and otherwise that Eric can provide some more specific advice to you. Um, and so with that, Eric, we're giving people a few more minutes back in their day. We're going to wrap things up. I want to thank you again for sharing this hour with us. Um, be well and take good care of yourself, each other, and the planet. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, everyone, for joining.